This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode 170, recorded February 10th, 2012. (laughs) I'm Alan Dove, and I obviously don't normally do this introduction. (laughs) Joining me this week on TWIV, uh, from the wilds of Fort Lee, New Jersey, we have Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Alan. Hello, Dixon. Things are good here. How about you? Things are good here. Yeah. Got some snow. I flubbed the intro, but other than that, I'm okay. Nah. <laughs> Vince does three takes before he actually goes for it anyway. Yeah, that's no. right. I'm just going to do this in one take. Yeah, so. <laughs> I think it's totally appropriate. Absolutely. Let people know what they're in for on this episode. You betcha. And joining us from North Central Florida, we have Rich Condit. Hi, fellas. How you doing? Hey, Rich. Rich. Well, doing good. Did did I hear snow? You got snow? Well, I'm asking Alan if he has any. Uh, No, not yet. They're saying it's going to, but today we're having another typical for this year you know, beautiful, sunny, That's right. t-shirt weather type of day. So Flowers are out. Yeah. Everybody's happy. <laughs> yeah. We'll see Good. what happens. How about you, Rich? How are things down there? 73 degrees, partly right. cloudy skies. It's good. Not, it's all good. Not bad. Yeah. Not bad. The, the, the reason people go to Florida in the winter. That's usually. right. <laughs> this is it. All right. So uh, I think we have a fun show lined up here. Um Although, uh, first first item on the agenda, we'll start off with a little bit of sad news. Uh, Norton Zinder has died. Oh, dear. Yeah. So, um... Gee, I knew him. Did you? Yeah, he was... Well, he was at Rockefeller, right? Rockefeller for a long time. Yeah, no, no, I knew him. I knew him. Gee. Yeah. So he died... Died at the age of 83, just uh, yesterday or the day before? Uh, it's at Friday, I think, he, he died. We just found out about it this week. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. So... He, uh, according to the, he graduated from Columbia University. Yep. Your fine institution at the age of 18 years old. Right. So he was a slow starter. Right. (laughs) Uh, Went to work with, uh, did graduate work with um, Joshua Letterberg. That's right. Uh, And Letterberg was at Wisconsin. Yep. And and he discovered uh, bacteriophage mediated gene transduction in bacteria. There you go. Studying P1 bacteriophage. I, I looked uh, I looked up a little bit of this stuff, and uh, I didn't look into it in any detail, but this is one of these things where it was a phenomenon which, if you didn't know what was going on mm. when you were in the process of discovering it, would have been enormously perplexing. That's When I've read the history of the early molecular biology, and you, and you read, if you go to some of those old papers, maybe we'll cover them on a future TWIV, but it's just, it's mind-boggling what they were looking at. How did this get over there? Or they knew the structure of DNA. Right. Right. Okay. I guess they knew it was the genetic material. Yes. Uh, which was also phage, discovered there, by the way. <laughs> right. The phage was uh, P1 phage, which goes into cells and in the process of its infection, chops up the uh, host chromosome. And uh, for whatever reason, probably none, uh, packages some of that into virus particles so that when you get a lysate out the other end, you got not only virus, but also particles that have host DNA in them. Right. Here, here. This can be used to, yeah, hey, it's gene therapy on bacteria. Yep. <laughs> That's you right. Deliver those pieces of DNA to other bacteria. Yep. Uh, and the patient dies, but the therapy is a success. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> so um, uh, uh, that was used as a gene, uh, gene mapping technique for a long time, and the phenomenon sure. itself is, is of interest. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, big guy in the field. So okay. he went on to um, uh, take, I guess, a faculty position at Rockefeller, right? That's right. And uh, he and a graduate student isolated a bunch of bacteriophages that were specific for pillus containing male E. coli. Uh-huh. Uh, so they, they called them, since that's the F factor, the F pillus, they called them F phages, F1 through 7. Right. And he spent most of the rest of his career studying two of those, one of which was a DNA phage very similar to M13, single-stranded DNA phage, and the other of which was an RNA phage. And he did some of the pioneering work in particular on RNA bacteriophages. Now he's a brilliant man. Yep. yep. And apparently in later years, he was became very sort of science-socially active. He was a yep. founding member right. of the Human Genome Project. 
That's right. Uh, one and uh, an advocate for basic science funding. The last PubMed um, listing I can find for him is a, a letter to uh, Zerhuni, the then, this is 2005, who was uh, uh, the uh, director of the NIH, uh, yes. co signed by many, many, many uh, individuals. Um, uh, expressing concern at the fact that so much funding was being funneled from basic research into biodefense. Yeah. Yeah. So, important force in the field. Yes. Yes. Led a, led a long and productive life. Yeah. yeah, I think he was involved in the early um, discovery of replicate plating as well. Uh, that, that's an interesting idea. That uh, I don't know about that, but that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Along with Letterberg, of course. Right. Right. Yep. Right. All right. So, uh, so farewell, Norton. Yes. Yep. And uh, moving along, we've uh, we've got actually a historical piece from a little bit further back as our first item on the agenda. And uh, Rich, this was your pick. I think it's. I think this is going to be great to talk about. Uh, so this is a um, a book that came out a few years ago. <laughs> um, it's called an, Inqui- an Inquiry into the Causes and Effects of the Variolae Vaccinae, a disease discovered in some of the western counties of England, particularly Gloucestershire, and known by the name of the cowpox. That's right. By uh, some guy named Edward Jenner. Right. Yeah. So uh, I always like these historical things. And uh, so this is the original publication by Edward Jenner yep. describing... Uh, vaccination for smallpox, which is the first, it's the birth of immunology, it's the birth of uh, vaccination, uh, it's the first vac- uh, vaccination ever uh, described. So, uh, in the Western world. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, right. so a little bit of background here. I know we've done this before in a couple of occasions, but uh, I'll try and be brief and do a little bit of background. The disease at issue here is smallpox, which was a disease acquired by a respiratory route that disseminated through the body and caused a severe blistering disease and had uh, a case fatality rate. These terms have acute meaning for me now. Okay. <laughs> a case fatality rate, uh, which I believe in this case is probably pretty much equivalent to the mortality rate, because basically if you got infected, you got sick. Right. I don't think there's any, uh, not much evidence for inapparent infections. Not that they would have much evidence at any rate. That's right. A um, uh, case fatality rate of uh, on the order of 30%. And this was uh, with us from as long as 3,000 years ago and spread from uh, the east through Europe and ultimately through uh, North America and was endemic in most of the populated uh, areas of Europe uh, by the uh, mid-16th, 17th, 18th centuries. Uh, So if you lived in Paris or London, you pretty much were sure that your children were going to get this disease and had about a 30% chance of dying for it from it and it was a gruesome disease not good so there's a strong motivation for trying to deal with it over time even from the earliest times people recognized that you mounted immunity to this and it was contagious and so people practiced various methods of artificially inducing the disease in order to uh, on a controlled circumstance in order to induce immunity and this uh, resulted ultimately in probably the safest and most popular pra- uh, practice pre-Jenner of a practice called variolation, where you took some mm-hmm. <clears throat> material from a person who had smallpox and artificially induced it into the skin of their uh, arm, and it induced uh, a pretty nasty reaction that was a lot of uh, blisters that spread could spread all over the, uh, you know, for centimeters around the original area, made you quite sick, you were contagious for smallpox, but uh, the case fatality rate from that was 1% or less. So you increased your chances of surviving the inevitable by on the order of 30-fold. So this was a, a very, very nasty undertaking, but worthwhile. That, by the way, was imported to England. It was popularized by a woman named Lady Mary Wortley Montague, who was the wife of the British ambassador to Turkey. And she uh, discovered it there and imported it to England and and sort of uh, popularized it's uh, from 1721 on. And so this was the 
<clears throat> context in which uh, Edward Jenner came on the scene, an English physician <coughs> chained, uh, trained with uh, John Hunter. Uh, ah, yes, very famous yes, man. Uh, his actually a biography of his was a Twiv pick, uh, yeah. quite some time ago, right. and. <clears throat> So we're talking about 1796 now, which is on the order of almost, what, 75 years after the introduction of variolation into England. And uh, Jenner, as a physician, is a variolator himself. He is a person who does this uh, procedure routinely. Now, I think, uh, in retrospect, it was f uh, f suspected by many that immunity to cowpox uh, conferred immunity to smallpox. Now, cowpox was a fairly mild disease that uh, milkers got from cows. This is a blistering disease that cows would have on their udders, and milkers would milk the cows. And if they had breaks in their skin or something, they would get these blistering uh, lesions on their skin. And it was a nuisance, but it was not seriously debilitating. <clears throat> and uh, the observation was that uh, milkmaids quite often didn't get smallpox. They had nice skin as a result. Um, and it was, uh, they were often refractory to attempts to variolate them. Uh, and Jenner, when he came on the scene, basically took advantage of this kind of put a bunch of stuff together and said, okay, let's do the real experiments. And he did a bunch of experiments, which ultimately he published in this article that we can post. It's available online that uh, Alan uh, introduced. Interestingly, he presented this to the... or Now, I don't know, Dixon, at the time... I'm referring to you because you know all kinds of stuff like this. Uh, <laughs> I'm at, not that at, old. <laughs> at the time, what the how things were published. I think it was presented. The idea was what you tried to do was present it through the your paper through the Royal Society. That's right. Uh, but uh, they didn't. They didn't want apparently want to present this. And no, no. with the encouragement of his friends down yep. the road, he yep. wound up publishing this with his own funds. That's right. right. Correct. But uh, it was printed for the author, as it says in my frontispiece, okay. right. uh, by okay. Samson Lowe uh, of Berwick Street in Soho. Okay. And it was also sold by Law, uh, Ave Maria Lane, and Murray and Hiley on Fleet Street. So he was right next to the uh, Demon Barber, for, I guess, maybe, who knows. <laughs> but, uh, and it also sold for uh, seven shillings uh, and this, Alan what does six D stand for? I think that's probably pence I know when you're buying nails at the hardware store a D is penny so yes I think that's right, right. I have an exact replica of this in my hands right now it's starting to fall apart unfortunately but I have one too leather bound and the whole uh, I, I wish it was uh, mine's leather not. bound and gold embossed oh brother it's got uh, color plates in it does oh, yours yeah. have color plates yeah it does but you're you remember you're a virologist I'm not <laughs> <laughs> yeah I just I got, I got I, seconds <laughs> I just did it the 21st century way I went to the Gutenberg um copy of it and actually they have the kindle version of it so you can download it and it's it reads like a yeah, book mine has kindle. pictures too and actually you can read this whole thing without much trouble it's not it's not, it's not right. yeah long, and it's a fascinating example of this the so, f's yes. or s's just keep yeah. that in mind yeah it's tough it's it's easier to read online for for that yeah. reason yes the, di the digital version corrected the uh, the odd typography I want to just very briefly summarize the content and then go through some of it. So oh, yeah, the absolutely. It's got an introduction, yep. and then he presents 23 cases. Uh, most of those are descriptions of how people who have naturally acquired smallpox, he is unable to variolate or who are otherwise apparently immune to smallpox. So that ah. sets up the situation where he says, uh, it looks like cowpox is conferring resistance to at least variolation, if not smallpox. Right. And then he does the experiment of doing this artificially, and I'll go through that. And then he's got some uh, uh, concluding stuff. Um, so, and this is um, this is, by the way, pretty typical of um, 18th through probably early 20th century um, uh, treatises of this sort. Um, you know, if you go if you go and you read Darwin, you'll you'll see this sort of an introduction, yeah, yeah. and then now I shall lay forward some cases and and just presenting the data um, case by case in a, in a story format. And he actually wrote this for his friend, right? C. H. Perry, 
at Bath. It says that's that's who he wrote this for. Right. So that was so, kind of interesting too. I, think. I love the uh, I love the first two paragraphs. Yeah. The, the DVA. I wish I could do this with a good British. <laughs> accent, <I'm>, Alan could. <laughs> uh, maybe. <laughs> the deviation of man from the state in which he was originally placed by nature seems to have proved to him a prolific source of diseases. <laughs> love of splendor from the indulgences of luxury, from his fondness for amusement, he has familiarized himself with a great number of animals which may not originally have. Been been intended for his associates <laughs> indeed the wolf disarmed of ferocity is now pillowed in the lady's lap he's talking about <laughs> dogs, dudes right the cat the little tiger of our island whose natural home is the forest is equally domesticated and caressed the cow the hog the sheep and the horse are all for a variety of purposes brought under his care and dominion well, now, interestingly, he recognizes there that a significant source of human disease is zoonoses. Yes, now, that's right. That's right. Uh, he goes on to uh, describe uh, cowpox, and there's a major error throughout this, which is that he believes um, that he never proves directly, and he can't because it's not true. He believes that the original source of the material that he's calling cowpox that is active against smallpox is actually from lesions on horses' hooves that uh, that are from a disease called grease. Yeah, I found this really interesting. Very confusing because it just in terms of the, the dis- word grease messed me up for a long time right so his his theory is that this you get this sore on a horse's hoof which is treated uh by a servant and and then um subsequently that servant goes and milks the cows and that's where you get the cowpox right uh and i think he uh i think he believes that cowpox can arise from other sources but it's only the material that comes from grease that is active uh in the uh immunization against smallpox that's what he believes anyway we now know that grease is a bacterial disease uh my guess is that uh, his epidemiology was failing him here. That probably the conditions that uh, foment that where farms are ripe for grease and for cowpox are similar, so they arise at the same time. Because he talks about periods of time when he can't find any cowpox around and can't find mm-hmm. any grease around. And then he'll talk about damp seasons and stuff where grease arises and cowpox arises at the same time. Right. So it's a, an informal epidemiological association that yep. turns out to be untrue. But the car, you're right, it's a, it's a correlation that turns out not to be causal. The cowpox has its own origin. Um, and this the other thing is a is a red herring, exactly. Right. So then he's got uh, upwards of fifteen cases that basically describe uh, how use uh, describe how naturally acquired cowpox or in a couple of cases horsepox wind up making an individual resistant to this practice of variolation and apparently resistant to smallpox as well. And then the real critical one here. Uh, that I think is actually worth reading is case 16. Aha. Here we go. Case 16. Sarah Nelms, a dairy maid at a farmer's near this place, was infected with the cowpox from her master's cows in May 1796. She received an infection on a part of her hand which had been previously in in a slight degree injured by a scratch from a thorn. Uh, this is an important observation. These uh, the disease is transmitted through breaks in the skin, and he discusses that at some length uh-huh. later on. A large pustulous sore and the usual symptoms accompanying the disease were produced in consequence. The pustule was so expressive of the true character of the cowpox as it commonly appears on the hand that I have given a representation of it in the annexed plate. And there's a drawing of this that's a famous drawing. It shows up in a lot of textbooks. Right. Right. The two small pustules on the wrist arose also from the application of the virus to some minute abrasions of the cuticle, but the livid tint, if they ever had any, was not conspicuous at the time I saw the patient. The pustule on the forefinger shoes the disease at an earlier stage. It did not actually appear on the hand of this young woman, but was taken from that of another. Ooh, we fixed the data. And ah. is it for the purpose of... <laughs> 
uh, next for the purpose of representing the malady after it has newly appeared. Okay, case 17. Here's the experiment. To more acutely observe the progress of the infection, I selected a healthy boy, about eight years old. We now know his name was James Phipps. For the purpose of inoculation for the cowpox, the matter was taken from a sore of the hand of the dairy maid, uh, who was infected by her master's cows, and it was, that was Sarah Nelms, and it was inserted on the 14th of May, 1796, into the arm of the boy by means of two superficial incisions, barely pre- penetrating the cutis, each about a half an inch long. So he's using the variolation technique right. to do right. this. On the seventh day, he complained of uneasiness in the axilla, his armpit, and on the ninth day, he became a little chilly, lost his appetite, had a slight headache. During the whole of the day, he was uh, perceptibly indisposed and spent the night with some degree of restlessness, but on the day following, he was perfectly well. Um, I, well, just, he he healed up, okay? Right, right. Uh, in order to ascertain whether the boy, after feeling so slight an affection of the system from the cowpox virus, was secure from the contagion of the smallpox, he was inoculated on the 1st of July, following, 1st of July following with variolous matter taken from a pustule. Okay, so this is six weeks later, and because variolation was a common practice, he could actually challenge him with smallpox. Right. No IRB, no nothing. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay? Several slight uh, punctures and incisions were made on both his arms, and the matter was carefully inserted, but no disease followed. Yep. The same appearances were observable on the arms, as we commonly see when a patient who has had variolous matter applied after having had either cowpox or smallpox. So you get a little reaction. It's a little... Um, uh, anaphylaxis, actually. Um, several months afterwards, he was again inoculated with variolous matter, but no sensible effect was produced on the Constitution. QED. Right, and this is interesting, too, because he goes into some depth describing these cases of naturally acquired cowpox, which uh, seem to lay people low for a few days, yeah. mm-hmm. and high fevers and very unpleasant, and then when he does this artificial inoculation with cowpox, it's much milder. Yes, actually, good uh, point. Which is which is an interesting parallel to the the uh, variolation, right? Um, you know, depending on the route of entry, you get this this milder, or I guess the inoculum size, maybe. Yeah, and actually, he talks about that sometime uh, at, at some length later on about how his observations suggest that the pathogenesis uh, pathogenesis of infection, both in the case of smallpox and cowpox, uh, might be influenced by the route of uh, entry of the virus, which is once again an astute observation. Right. Right. So then he has uh, a few other cases that he describes up to 23 that where he describes how the cowpox can be artificially transferred from human to human. And this becomes important because it's not always easy to get the right thing from nature. And uh, uh, subsequently in the process of developing this technique, people did practice human to human vaccination for a period of time before they discovered that they could uh, transmit it artificially on cows. And that's the preferable technique because if you do it human to human there's a danger that you will transmit other diseases inadvertently like for example syphilis right and so ultimately human to human uh propagation of the vaccine was outlawed Uh, there's one other thing that i think is uh, really interesting and that is case 23 which is actually he's reporting on uh very late or the same experiment basically done by his nephew um, and he describes, let me see, let me get the, I've noted the paragraph here, I think. Uh, yes, paragraph 59, uh, where he's quoting his nephew here. Uh, his nephew challenged a guy that he had vaccinated. Um, and he says, to convince myself that the variolous matter made use of was in perfect state i at the same time inoculated a patient with some of it who had never gone through the cowpox and it produced the smallpox in the usual <laughs> regular matter uh-huh. okay? so he did the positive control yeah absolutely which i think was important <laughs> <laughs> a little bit uh, cavalier yes <laughs> well yes and, and then the next paragraph these experiments afforded me much satisfaction yes right <laughs> 
Uh, there's a, a good thing here about him trying to convince himself that he's right about the Greece. And I liked mm-hmm. this. This is later on. They who are not in the habit of conducting experiments may not be aware of coincidence of circumstances necessary for their being managed so as to prove perfectly decisive. Okay, that's a way of saying, uh, I'm not really sure about this one. Yeah. At least I, <laughs> or how men, or how often men engaged in professional pursuits are liable to interruptions which disappoint them almost uh-huh. at the instance of their being accomplished. <laughs> All right. So uh, these didn't quite work out. I can't really prove this. However, yeah. Yeah. I feel no room for hesitation respecting the common origin of the disease, being well <laughs> convinced that it never appears amongst the cows, blah, blah, blah. He right. thinks it's Greece. Right. 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 So that, that's a, some pretty convoluted language to say, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I can't prove this completely, but I really think that this is the answer. Right, and and somewhere in the text he also mentions that if you uh, take a pus from the cowpox and place it into a vial, and then allow that to ferment, <laughs> putrefy, as he said, uh, over several days, and then try to use that as the uh, the vaccination fluid, uh, you a you don't get any cowpox produced, and b you end up killing the patient. Yeah, because right. they develop a secondary infection from all that stuff inside. Right. Yeah. So this is uh, uh, actually we should say that uh, you know you've grown <laughs> a bunch of stuff the and same you time as the guy. So uh, right, because you you took this off an open sore, you right? Did. And then you let it incubate at some temperature for a period of days, and then you stuck it into somebody else in and, the and, warmth and, of your jacket. That's yes, in the warmth said. of your right. jacket, I think was where he, where he carried it, and and then. Surprise, surprise! That yeah. Christ, uh, so even as late as the '60s, uh, ultimately the ultimately vaccine production during the eradication campaign consisted of basically giving a, a calf a confluent vaccination on their belly and then scraping off all the lymph and grinding it up some to get rid of the big pieces and spinning out the big stuff and then adding a little phenol to kill most of. The bacteria, and then, or at least discourage its growth, and then making a, and then lyophilizing it. And if you take that stuff, and this stuff was used, I mean, it was only very recently that this has been replaced with a cell culture vaccine. If you take that stuff and streak it out on a petri dish, it's full of bacteria and stuff. It's a very, very crude preparation. Would never pass muster uh, with uh, with the FDA. And I, I also was going to say that. Uh, it was not Jenner who called this vaccination. I believe that was Pasteur who hmm. coined the term vaccination, vacha meaning cow in right. Latin, uh, in honor of Jenner, ultimately. How about that? It's also interesting that Jenner uses the term virus throughout this yep. to describe the agent that is causing the disease. But that's, I mean, obviously we didn't know what viruses were. This is even before germ theory, right? Yep. Right. So, so uh, right because this, using is, this that, is pre-Pasteur. Right. So he's talking about a. He's using the word virus as basically a a, a, a malady. Right. 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 Vi- virus in its original um, meaning of poison. Right. Sure. But so, but but lucky choice of terms. Variolation was quite common before Jenner's publication, though. Right. Yes, and as a matter of fact, after he published this. So variolation refers to the use of smallpox, right? Uh, the smallpox itself, in order ah. to induce immunity. Okay, that's how that uh, term is used, uh-huh. and that goes all the way back. And there are several different methods that goes all the way back yeah. to the Chinese. Yeah. You can uh, you can uh, uh, snort crusts of mm. uh, of scabs from powdered scabs from people who'd had mild disease that was right. as long as the 10th century long ago as the 10th century AD sure this uh, cutaneous variolation was developed later in the east and ultimately Im- imported uh, to England now at, at the same time it's noteworthy that after Jenner published this yeah uh, several people came up and said wait a minute wait a minute I did this 20 years ago, <laughs> all right? There's a guy in particular named Jesse, uh, yep. who in fact can lay claim to having done this 20 years before Jenner. Sure. But first of all, he didn't do all the controlled experiments, and he didn't publish. He didn't publish. Okay? Nope. And nope. he also didn't, uh, he didn't do the challenge experiment. No, no. All right? So Jenner gets credit for really having done 
the definitive set of experiments uh, uh, and uh, others. It's not like he was uh, working in a vacuum. Uh, right. uh, he had variolation to work with. He had a lot of local rumor and some knowledge of the notion that cowpox would confer immunity to smallpox. But he did the uh, the definitive experiments and published them. Well, and that's fairly typical of these historical papers. You know, you have Newton versus Leibniz or Wallace versus Darwin. Um, there are these ideas that seem to be kind of floating around, and usually a couple of people will um, will will hit on them. And uh, the one who not only publishes, but in in many cases does the better job of explaining what's going on, um, usually ends up being the one that we remember. Or if you can afford to self-publish. Yes, (laughs) yes. It helps a lot. So he has some concluding uh, paragraphs where, I won't go through all of these, Uh, there's there's a couple here where he basically says that uh, this is a better procedure than variolation because it uh, doesn't cause as much discomfort and he's never seen any fatalities. And then his last paragraph is worth uh, reading here. Thus far, I have proceeded in an inquiry founded, as it must appear, on the basis of experiment, in which, however, conjecture has been occasionally admitted in order to present to persons well-suited for such discussion objects of a more minute investigation. In the meantime, I shall myself continue to prosecute this inquiry, encouraged by hope of its becoming essentially uh, essentially beneficial to mankind. And actually, he published two other papers on the same thing subsequently, but this is this is the biggie. So there you go. Yeah. It's quite it's, interesting, uh, though. You know, he has an interesting history here. I'm, I'm reading a little about this in our a, in a recounting of the history of, of uh, smallpox vaccination, and it said that... Uh, he was also a uh, hot air balloon aficionado. Oh, is that and, right? I didn't know. Yeah, that. yeah. Uh, Montgolfier brothers in France. Uh, he actually he built two of his own. In this case, hydrogen filled balloons. He said it flew at twelve miles, and then he began studying bird behavior of all things, and published a paper in eighteen uh, seventeen eighty eight, and uh, made original observations that the cuckoo hatching. Hatchlings uh, evict the eggs and chicks of the foster parents from the nest. Now, it says afterwards, trust me on this, it says afterwards, for this remarkable work, (laughs) not his vaccination work, but for the work of the cuckoo, (laughs) Jenner was elected a fellow of the Royal Society. (laughs) So you never know what they're going to pick up on uh, with regards to what you do. Well, um, he's yes, he's a fellow of the Royal Society when he publishes uh, this treatise that we just talked about. Uh, if you look at the title page, it's by Edward Jenner, M.D., F.R.S. Aha! Et so this, this, this may be a misrepresentation of so his he was, uh, he was, uh, credentials. His initial claim to fame uh-huh. um, was apparently cuckoo. And, uh, <laughs> That's right. And then he um, did vaccination, for which he's actually remembered. <laughs> right. So, uh, by, by the way, I want to <laughs> replug the... Um, uh, we've said that his uh, mentor was... Uh, John Hunter. Yes. And the book that I picked uh, many months ago yes. uh, was called The Knife Man, The Extraordinary Life and Times of John H- Hunter, Father of Modern Surgery. Uh-huh. And it's a terrific biography of this guy. Yeah, That's worth yeah, looking at again. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, Hunter was amazing. All right. Okay. Yeah. So yep. um, I thought it would be interesting since we've, we've now discussed the dawn of vaccination. Um, to look at a more recent paper, um, and the one that uh, it's actually been in our our TWIV ideas file for, uh, well, I think since it came out, um, is this paper, uh, Norovirus Vaccine Against Experimental Human Norwalk Virus Illness. Uh, it's from the New, New England Jur- Journal of Medicine, uh, December 8, 2011. Um, and That's Norwalk, Ohio, I presume. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's right. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, See, and, I do uh, some things here. That is by uh, <laughs> Atmar Bernstein, Haro, uh, Alibrahim, Chen, Ferreira, Estes, Graham, Opekan, Richardson, and Mendelman. Um, fairly large team, as you might expect. Now, this is a this is a clinical trial. Um, so this is a double-blind, placebo-controlled, multi-center trial. The usual, the gold standard. Um, 
This is a fascinating contrast to what we just did. This yes. is terrific. Yes. This so is I think great. I, I <laughs> saw this in the queue and I said, oh, well, well, we're, we'll, we'll talk about a few other virology or a few other vaccinology uh, news items here too. But I saw this one in the queue and I looked at it and I said, oh, this would be perfect. So this is how it's done today. <laughs> exactly. Um, and uh, they... Uh, they want it. They they've got this um, virus-like particle vaccine. So this is um, we've talked about norovirus before, um, episode one hundred and what was that? Uh, Ralph, your cruise director. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we've just run uh, around. Keep going. I'll look it up. <laughs> right. Um, so yeah. So we, we have one thirty-four. Uh, okay. Uh-huh. That was we had uh, Stephanie Carstorm. That's right. All right. Uh, so we got the rundown. If you want, to, if you want to know more about Noro, that's all in there. But this is a um, this is a Khaleesi virus um, that uh, unfortunately we don't have a good cell culture system for it. We don't have a good animal model for it. Um, it's not terribly lethal if you're in good shape, but it is terribly unpleasant. Um, so this is the the famous cruise ship or winter vomiting virus that hits people at both ends and two bucket disease the two bucket disease yes <laughs> that's what this is <clears throat> um so that raises obvious challenges in developing a vaccine but this one um is uh i think ligocyte pharmaceuticals is the company that is now developing this um and uh, they've taken the if you take the virus um uh, capsid genes and you put them into cells you can get virus like particles out so they're hollow viral shells um, and preliminary assays of this indicated that they that they induce antibodies in people and so this study is where the rubber meets the road um, they they got um, let's see what the numbers were I think they had about a hundred they screened 454 people. Yes, and it's and enrolled 98. Enrolled 98. So they they had this big screening, and they were very they were very specific about who they wanted in this. Not only did you have to be healthy enough to probably survive a bout of norovirus, um, and you had to have you know no no medical contraindications to all that. They also wanted people. Um, who were positive for the presence of fucosyl transferase 2. So this is a gene, I think we talked about this on the Noro episode. Um, I think we did. People who don't have a functional uh, FUT2 gene, fucosyl, fucosyl transferase 2 gene, are genetically immune from norovirus. Uh, it appears to be a receptor problem. Right. So um, I don't know if there's any downside to being genetic. Uh, you know, Apparently, these people don't know it otherwise. Um, so they had to test everybody for that. And susceptibility, the previous data suggested susceptibility also varies by blood type. Um, and so they, they deliberately selected people who had the blood types that were most susceptible to norovirus. Uh, so, yeah, they screened 454 people and they enrolled 98 of them. And then randomly assign them to vaccine or placebo groups, um, and uh, they've got uh, 50, 50 for vaccine, forty eight for placebo. They lose a few to follow up along the way. Uh, the protocol is um, they get they get two doses of this vaccine, and it's intranasal. And by the way, the vaccine is made in. Uh it's uh, the capsid proteins are cloned in baculovirus and made right. in baculovirus infected cells and then purified. So we right. got so, recombinant mm-hmm. DNA technology on top of everything else. Right. So and it's uh, grown in insect cells, right? Yes. So so then that's purified and this is what's being shot into the nose. Um, and these people got two doses. Um, and they lost some. They lost somebody to follow up. Uh, some people only got only ended up showing up for one dose. Some withdrew. One got pregnant. You know, human study. These things happen. Um, I'm sure Jenner would have just pressed on, but these are yeah. all, uh, these are contraindications. <laughs> this is all these, true. <laughs> you can't just grab a random eight year old. Um, so then they um, they waited. Uh, what was the three weeks? Three weeks. Yes, three weeks after the vaccination. Uh, they brought these folks all in, admitted them to the hospital, 
told them they were going to stay there for four days at least, because if they got sick, that's how long they'd have to keep them. Yep. Um, and then they challenged them with norovirus, uh, and this is the same serotype that the vaccine is against, which is an important point. Right. Because um, there, are, there are a number of serotypes to choose from. Uh, this vaccine is against one of them. And in this study, they're just looking at a best case scenario. So if you get exposed to the same strain that you were vaccinated against. Um, and then they looked at, uh, so they, they looked at antibody titers before they challenged them. And then they challenged them and they saw who got sick, essentially, was the study. Yeah. Um, so I, I was I was interested in... Um, how rapid the onset was after they they shoot the mm-hmm. norovirus into these people's noses one person got sick in 19 minutes yeah that person was a little strange <laughs> yes. i don't think so um i don't think so yeah that person was a little uh what there's a description of that yeah and they, they this one really stuck out at me the participant um was infected with a g2.4 norovirus strain was the only person who had an eliza uh Zero response to Norwalk virus and did not have shedding of Norwalk virus in the stool. So, not, yeah, right. So this person, <clears throat> they, they're in the placebo group, um, and so they did, they got the placebo um, vaccine, which, by the way, has um, a couple has the sugar component of the vaccine, but it does not have the adjuvants. Yeah, and that's a mistake. Right, right. They should have made it an exact copy minus the. That's the, right. The because there's the okay. So the other, the other issue here, is that they only waited three weeks. Yes. And th- this is this is tough because one of the problems with uh, norovirus, apparently a significant problem, is that immunity appa- apparently is not long lived. Exactly. Even from a natural infection couple of couple of years later you can get infected with the same strain again Mm -hmm. but and i don't know what the logic was here but it seems to me that this this and we haven't really gotten the results yet but the idea here is to i would think is to show that you can in fact get an antibody response and that you can get protection so if you want to do that you probably have to do for uh, short term because if you go long term you don't get anything you don't know whether you're your vaccine worked or not right in fact i think they even refer to it um in the discussion as a proof of principle right which is really what it is this is not a vaccine that you would roll into the clinic tomorrow right and now now down the road they're going to have to address all this stuff like serotypes and uh uh, duration durability of the immunity and etc this just says proof proof of principle you can do it right but i still still uh, uh, leaving the adjuvant out of the uh, placebo group that doesn't that doesn't make any sense to me. Right, and I, the, right because the the issue there is um, not only has one group gotten the vaccine and the other a placebo, one group has gotten the adjuvant and the other placebo, and the adjuvant is going to have kind of a generic immune boosting effect. Right. So it's it's supercharged the immune system. Um, gives them the response against the vaccine, but it also probably gives them some secondary ability. And they they mention that as a as a confounding factor. I don't know why it was done that way, though. Uh, it might have been some some risk issue. Uh, although these are approved adjuvants, um, so that was just the just a study design choice. Um, so the results, um, the thing. It essentially works in this very, as we've said, limited setting. Um, so they're looking at uh, what's the bottom line here is um, uh, Norwalk specific IgA response. Um, that's uh, that's you know their, the immune response met their threshold in seventy percent of the people who got the vaccine. Right. Um, and interestingly, the increase in antibodies. Uh, well, I guess not surprisingly, uh, the the antibody increase that you see from the vaccine is less than the antibody increase that you see from the natural infection. Right. Right. So, in people who get the vi- who get the virus, uh, who get sick in the um, uh, in the challenge part of the of the assay, whether they were vaccinated or not, they get a boost in immunity 
that's more significant than what the vaccine did. So the vaccine's not as good as a natural infection at that. And it is a an intranasal <laughs> administration. I wouldn't. It surprised me a little bit that an inactive, just a protein. It's an inactive uh, thing. It's a virus-like particle. Would actually work um, administered uh, intranasally yes. in the mucosa. That I, maybe I shouldn't be surprised at that, but I was. I, I was a little bit too, because you'd think uh, obviously the idea is it's going to roll down the throat, but wouldn't you just digest it? <laughs> yeah. So uh, well, and I think I think the idea, among other things, is to uh, infect the the nasal mucosa as well. You want to, I mean, it is a in a way a mucosal infection ultimately. Right. Uh, anyway, so and you want to. So the idea is, I guess, among other things, to induce mucosal immunity, which they right. get because right. what they're getting That's is right. IgA, uh, IgA right. Uh, which right. is a diagnostic of a mm-hmm. mucosal immunity. Right. And I guess the um, you know you would if it were just the the VLPs, you just they they would just break down. Um, but the addition of the adjuvant is probably what's causing an immune response. It makes it look more, more like a threat. I was interested that one of the things, it's not actually an adjuvant, but one of the components is a thing called chitosan. Yes. Uh, which is a polysaccharide that right. you can get from uh, chitin, like shrimp shells. Right. Yes. Uh, and it's supposed to help. The idea, I think, it's used for all sorts of things, water filtration and et cetera. Sure. And it's uh, supposed to... Um, uh, the idea was to uh, help the VLPs adhere to the mucosa with this stuff. Right. Uh, but I th- uh, thought it was interesting that it was also frequently sold as a tablet from health stores as a fat binder. <laughs> really? It's supposed to have the capability to interact with lipids in the digestive system and limit their absorption of the body. Whenever I see uh, uh, additions to vaccines, I think, uh-oh, people are going to freak out about this. And then I see, oh, wait a minute, this they're, is a good one. They're already right. eating it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's you can right. buy this in a health store. <laughs> Right, so they got um, they got antibody response in seventy percent of the people they vaccinated, and it does seem to um, to reduce the uh, the incidence and the severity of gastroenteritis that they're getting. Um, so, right, sixty nine percent of the people who got placebo got sick versus thirty seven percent of the people who got the vaccine. But that's the same as we talked about uh, in another episode of TWIP for the malaria vaccine and that's not looked at as a very uh, uh a good number because it's less than 50 percent well and the di- but the difference there is the malaria vaccine is actually being pursued as a as a clinical intervention right this is proof of principle this is proof of principle if they were if they were right. selling this right. as something that right. let's let's roll it out to the third world this okay. instance okay. then i think that right. would be totally right. inappropriate or just pop one of these pills before you go on that cruise right and if you're on an Italian cruise, you better bring your life preserver yes. with you as well. Yes. <laughs> Forget Norwalk, Norwalk virus. Just remember to fall into the right lifeboat. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Follow the captain. That's the easiest way I know. <laughs> there were no uh, no adver- uh, no ad- no severe adverse effects right. in the um, experimental uh, cohort. Nah. There were two severe adverse effects in the placebo group. Placebo group. Mm-hmm. <laughs> one patient, one participant was hospitalized for treatment of appendicitis. Really? And another was hospitalized for psychosis 42 days after inoculation. Oh, Both man. episodes resolved and were judged to be unrelated to the study. Yes. That seems like a fair judgment. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> Doing these trials, I can't imagine how much this cost. Right. These guys got paid a lot of money for going and through all, those four all days. All the hospital. work and approval and stuff like oh, that. It's yeah. just, it's oh, just yeah. huge to do this. Yeah. And this is not even, this isn't even a, a full scale phase three, let's go to market type of trial. This is, this is what you would characterize as a phase two. Yep. Um, so you've got a, you've got a hundred, only a hundred people enrolled. And in fact, they, they go through a lot of discussion of the statistics on this, you know, how much can we really conclude from a group of 100 people? Um, but the, the, the primary endpoints, it seems like they got <clears throat> a pretty good first line result. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the cost of doing a trial like this is just astronomical. Well, they got most of their money from the company, it looks like. 
Yes. Well, yeah, that's the that's the trade-off in developing something like this. You uh, sure. You spend a lot of money up front in the hope that you'll be able to sell something at the end. That's right. So a little over 200 years later, yes. <laughs> it's a that's little different. Are. That's, that's right. a little different. Right. Indeed. And... Um, yeah, and they and they are they're pretty forthright in the discussion, you know, acknowledging, hey, we've stacked the deck here. Um, yeah, we we picked people who were who were likely to be susceptible. We challenged them with a strain that was homologous to the vaccine, and um, you know, this is uh, this is not good to go. Um, but it does it does indicate this and earlier work um, shows that we've at least found good correlates of immunity here. Uh -huh. So the people in this study and the people in earlier studies who have um, good antibody responses against norovirus seem to be reasonably protected against that virus. Um, the problem is that those levels fall over time uh, for whatever reason, and then you're not as well protected. But that's that's a really good surrogate measure that can then be used, so you don't always have to be asking, well are they getting the virus? Are they getting the virus? Now you can probably use this in vaccine development and say, okay, the goal is to induce the antibody response. Yeah. The, pro the problem is now uh, you, you can't do a follow-up with these guys because you've challenged them. Right. right. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about the long-term <laughs> immunity. So I guess the next thing you do, since you've got a correlation with uh, antibody response, I suppose you can immunize people, measure the antibody response uh, over a much longer period of time, and then do the challenge and see what happens. Yeah, exactly. you can see if it fades out and if it's correlated or not with that. That's true. Right. right. Now, and by the way, uh, uh, um, mucosal-based immunities are not as long-lived in many cases as mm -hmm. uh, systemic. Right. So that's probably what accounts for this. And, of course, in a longer trial, you'll have to recruit more people because you'll lose more of them to follow up. It is a, a heroic piece of work that went into this. Have obviously. they considered moving to Norwalk, Ohio and trying this again <laughs> under a natural conditions? <laughs> uh, well, let's see. They're from, they're from Baylor, also Cincinnati Children's Hospital. So they're already, yeah, they're already in the state. Uh, University of Maryland and Johns Hopkins is uh, there from and and Ligocyte Pharmaceuticals is in Bozeman, Montana. Yeah, what is it now? Because why not? You hey. can go work there, Dixon, and go fishing. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm sure it was picked for that very reason, quite possibly. <laughs> Plus, low taxes for their for their uh, for their factory or whatever they've uh, got. There. Yes, that probably. Uh, so um, I. I Picked up a couple of other little news items about vaccines, too, that kind of uh, surveyed where the landscape is these days. And um, it just is a little update for something we talked about way back on TWIV 48. Um, the uh, um, H5N1 influenza vaccine. Um, and this is right up your alley, Dixon. This is the one that's grown in plants, I believe. Aha! The Metacago. Um, yeah. Um, they are now uh, getting ready to do a clinical trial on it. Excellent. Yeah. Well, that's so, exciting. That so news. we covered the uh, plant-based technology some time ago. You had that written down. Uh, yeah, that's right. right. Alan, uh, TWIV 48. Right. They were, um, they were even using tobacco plants at one point, mm -hmm. I think. And I think that this leaves. is a fascinating. Apparently, you can very quickly make very large amounts of this stuff. And so I'm, I'm glad to see this uh, go that? forward into a clinical trial. It'll be interesting to see that happen. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And it's timely. H5N1 is in the news. Sure. I'd heard something about that. It's becoming yeah. uh, it's becoming more and more relevant, I think. And a, a plant-based vaccine, because of the scale-up ability, would be great for flu in general and for H5 in particular. Sure. Right. Because this is something you could have a, a certain number of doses sitting around if you get a vaccine that works. Obviously, they're still in clinical trials, but once you've once you've proven it um, in initial trials, then you could just have some plant stock sitting around. And when you have your when you have your pandemic, bam, you go and you grow it up, and you've got suddenly millions of doses of vaccine going out the door. That look at that. Uh, right, and this is a uh, it's a virus like particle, right? Right. Yes. Rather than, so so you don't have to go through 
all of the stuff of making the appropriate reassortant viruses and yeah, yeah. Uh, throwing right. them right. and worry about whether or not they're going to grow and stuff like that. All you need is the genes that are antigenic in that particular virus, and it, it, it cuts the process by a very significant amount. Uh, so you can get it uh, into the market uh, much faster. So that has some significant advantages. I think that the disadvantage here that I'm becoming more and more aware of is that with both this and the other inactivated vaccines, is a paper that we uh, talked about uh, recently, is that there's at least a suggestion that you get better heterotypic immunity with a live vaccine. So yes. as has often been discussed, the live vaccines <coughs> may have some advantages because they replicate relative to the um, either subunit as this one is or, or killed vaccines. But in terms of dealing with a problem like flu uh, cheaply and rapidly, right. uh, this has some ser serious advantages. Yes. Gentlemen, I've just uncovered a paper in my random searching on PubMed called Bioprocessing of Plant-Derived Virus-Like Particles of Norwalk Virus Capsid Protein Under Current Good Manufacture Practice Regulations. Uh -huh, there you go. So is this is out of the uh, Biodesign Institute at Arizona State University in, uh, I think that's in Tempe, Arizona. It is. Uh, so it's right on target for our topic today, too. Right. Nice. Great. Good catch, and that just came out in December as well. It did. Even in New Jersey, I can access this literature. Yes. Yes, it was in plant cell reproduction. Uh, plant cell, let's see. Plant cell, plant cell reproduction. That's correct. That's yeah. exactly correct. I will, exactly. I will paste that into the... Uh, yeah. And here they are, even making monoclonal antibodies in plants as well. So a whole bunch of uh, new approaches to uh, producing biomedically um, relevant molecules using our friends, the plants, uh, could jumpstart another uh, facet to this uh, field of urban agriculture. Absolutely. Right, because you, you would want to grow those in a contained greenhouse. You bet. <clears throat> And close by, the, to by the way, did we ever formally acknowledge that Vincent isn't here today? <laughs> we have not, but I think <laughs> they may have summarized that he's there, he has laryngitis, <laughs> yes. or he may be indisposed, and uh, he's out there giving away money for the NIH, I hope. They're trying to give away money. Yeah, yeah exactly. Vincent, Vincent, is doing, Vincent is doing the hard job. Vincent is doing service, That's right. and he's uh, trying to... Uh, help decide who gets money and who does. Uh, actually, you don't make funding decisions. No, you don't. You do not. You just evaluate the science. That right. is exactly. So, it it ends up it ends up being a, a funding decision because the, only the top whatever it is now point oh 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 one percent are going to get. Uh, oh, that's that's really sad. But really sad. Uh, no, no, not by much. Not by much is right. Yeah. Particularly now that they've uh, suddenly decided they're going to take fifty million dollars from one place and move it over to another. Yep. Uh, <laughs> But that is, a, that is another topic for this week in funding. <laughs> <laughs> so you found another one here, too. Uh. Yes, I did. And this, um, this I thought, was just kind of a, a neat um, view of, of how incredibly successful immunization has been. So this is um, uh, Merck and Sanofi Pasteur are collaborating on a, um, a hexavalent pediatric vaccine. Um, so this thing, they're, they're now in phase three clinical trials. Actually, they went into phase three clinical trials in April of last year. So they're now in this. Um, and the trial, we, we were talking about how much it costs to look at 100 patients. This is 1,440 infants are in this phase three trial. And they're looking at uh, safety and immunogenicity of this hexavalent, um, what is it, uh, DPT, uh, rotavirus, um, uh, DPT, yeah, DTAP, DTAP, um, inactivated poliovirus, uh, Haemophilus influenzae B, and Hep B. So that's diphtheria, uh, tetanus, pertussis, uh, all three serotypes of polio, uh, Haemophilus influenzae, and hepatitis B, uh, all jammed into a single shot. Wow. And, of course, the reason we like to combine these vaccines is because so many of them have been developed that you now, 
We're, you know, we're now addressing all these these diseases that used to kill lots and lots of people. Well, a couple of the yeah, ones yeah. I just listed still do. Um, and in order to get all those into people early in life, you want to do it as quickly as possible. Um, so now this uh, this would be great. You know, that's uh, that's a couple less shots that kids have to get. Exactly. I think that's an important aspect of this. It's a couple yep. less shots that kids have. You're going to get better compliance yes. if you do that. Sure. Uh, now, is there is there a known downside to giving multiple vaccines at the same time? I don't know the answer to this. I My reading on this, uh, I haven't delved deeply into it, but I've read a little bit about... Um, the the combination vaccine problems that that have come up um and this goes this goes a fair way back um you know the polio vaccine is a combination of three serotypes the measles mumps rubella is a combination of three different viruses um and there's a lot of tinkering that has to go on in the early development of these things to get the balance right because inevitably one thing will be more immunogenic than another and so you can't just give equal amounts of everything because then you'll get a robust response against a couple of things and no response against a couple of others. Um, as far as how many things you can incorporate in a vaccine and still have it work, I don't think that's been nailed down. Um, this would certainly seem to me to be the, the, at the cutting edge. Uh, right. A hex so my guess is there's going to be a lot of... Uh, data collected on this to yes. address that that issue among right. other things. Right, well, that'll be good to have. And it's a safety and immunogenicity trial, so they're going to be tra- tracking. Um, not only does anybody have any any problems with this, but also um, do you get robust responses against all of these things, and how long do those responses last? Are they equivalent? And and comparing the parameters on all of those. So right. there we are again, two hundred years later. Yes. With a bucket full of vaccines. Right. So many that we have to stick them together and uh, see if we can uh, administer them all together to make things easier. Right. Great. Alan, and remind, I think, okay. remind me again as to the list that you uh, gave us as to which ones are live, uh, attenuated versus just um, molecular vaccines. Oh, you're going to put me on the spot here. Uh, <laughs> well, Let's I thought see. about that. I it's, think it's, all of these are either subunit or killed. Yeah. Yes. That's that's right. So okay. I was thinking, you know, but you've got other uh, candidates there like uh, yellow fever and, and mumps and that sort of thing and measles that uh, you wouldn't po- you wouldn't probably put those all together into this vaccine to give it, would you? Or would you? I don't know. I don't think so. I think you're going to want to separate uh, if only if only for clinical reasons, you'll want to separate your live virus vaccines from your killed ones because there are there are whole populations of people who should not get live virus vaccines. Right, and then of these, the, of these first, then uh, assuming this all works, how many, uh, how many injections total do you need to give in order to make someone fully immunized? That I do not know. I think most of these in this list are are usually given as three shot courses. Yes, I would I would guess that's true too. Um, Except for tetanus, which is just given as a boost. Given every right every ten years, but um, yeah, I think these are. This is probably going to be a three shot. Regimen, and it's interesting to me that um, <clears throat> that IPV is included, um, and it, and I've been thinking a lot about um, smallpox recently. Not only because of this show, but also because of this whole biodefense discussion that's that's erupted again recently. Um, and it occurs to me that <clears throat> if we hadn't tried to eradicate smallpox, we would probably now have a much safer vaccine for it that might very well have just been incorporated the way we're incorporating polio vaccine. You know, this is a hexavalent vaccine that's intended for the first world market where there's no polio effectively. And yet we're just, we're going to keep vax. I fully favor this. It's an absolutely not a criticism. I think it's an excellent idea to keep vaccinating for that virus. Um, but it's interesting to me to see how, even when somebody said, oh, we're going to eradicate this, um, you can simply incorporate this in a multi-subunit vaccine, and then you never have to worry about it again. Mm. Right. And it'll just, if it stays there in the hexavalent vaccine, that'll just be the way things are. And even after we eradicate uh, polio in the wild, if that ever happens, um, 
then you can just continue distributing this vaccine and you don't have to worry about, oh, is it going to thaw out of the permafrost or fall out of a laboratory or, or is somebody going to pour it in the water supply? Mm-hmm. I'm looking at my, um, I've got on my iPhone here uh, an app that I think was a pick some months ago that's this vaccine app that I actually oh, yeah. use all the time. Hmm. And yes, all three of these are administered in at least uh, three mm-hmm. doses. Okay. <clears throat> and so that covers, what did we say? Hep B, DTAP, HIB, and IPV. Um, PCV, and ICV, uh, uh, IPV. And so that leaves in the normal vaccination schedule rotavirus, which is right. a live attenuated virus, right. uh, MMR, which is live attenuated, and varicella. Mm-hmm. Mm. Okay, so which is also live attenuated. So basically, right. it's all of the standard inactivated vaccines. That's it. Put together, and yep. the uh, live ones will be dealt with otherwise. separately. Yes, right. and I suspect the live ones are going to be harder to combine than the killed ones. Could be. Just right. a guess. It's also interesting to see that there hasn't been any emergence of a DNA vaccine for any of these that has become standard. That's right. It's been uh, researched quite a bit, but a lot. Ever make it? None of them ever made it to the market. Well, the thing is, from a corporate perspective, it's a hard sell um, because there's, you know, there, there's nothing for for most of these. There's not really anything wrong with the vaccine. DTAP people occasionally have bad reaction to. Yeah, well, the Haemophila was uh, was for many many years looked at as a very very harsh vaccine, right? Because it was just. Uh, killed crushed up bacteria right and that was uh, eliciting lots of other side effects as well but uh, a dna vaccine maybe for an interfering rna or something like this right you'd have to the thing is you would have to get some major advantage that would allow you to recoup your research costs oh well, sure not so much your research costs i hear what you're saying clinical yeah. trial costs uh indeed um and and the fact is these are vaccines that work extremely well and they're extremely safe and they're extremely cheap um, so you'd be competing against that, and well, do you want to pay five times as much for a vaccine that that you know reduces your chance of having a sore arm by one billionth of a percent? Yeah. Uh, so if we're going to see a DNA vaccine, it'll probably be in something something new. I mean, it's been right. I've seen it well, pursued yeah. pretty heavily in the context of uh, HIV vaccines. Yeah, exactly. Yes. That's what I was thinking about. Too. Yeah, and in HIV vaccines, it makes a lot of sense too because you want to induce cellular immunity, and that's that's tricky with these others. Indeed. All right. So that's um, 200 years of vaccinology in 60 yeah. minutes or so. <laughs> and uh, I think we could do a few emails here. You so, guys have got them. Go for it. All right. Uh, first one is from John, who says, Good day to the TWIV nation. I'm giving a shout out to Dr. Welkin Johnson from TWIV 168. He got us listening for Viruses, Genes, and Evolution course at Boston College. The lectures on Virology 101 have been extremely helpful and refreshing. I got excited to hear he was a guest this past week. Be sure to keep him coming back so his students can eventually make him his own auto-tuned remix of his comments on TWIV and get it going viral on YouTube. Um, I was thinking about the vector immunoprophylaxis results by Baltimore's lab at Caltech and see them as very exciting. See reference below. Uh, and he includes a uh, an article in Nature. Um, I think that's the original article. Yes, oh. I think so. Yes, that's the uh, one we discussed. Right. Um, yet, provided these results may yield a future vaccine, it seems likely to me the final product would only be administered to people in close contact with HIV-infected inf- individuals and not everyone. Perhaps those that are traveling or working with patients of HIV, such as nurses or paramedics. Furthermore, with HIV as the target, many new vaccines would be in development for other target surface proteins year after year. The difficulty surely lies in developing various vaccines that elicit specific immune responses effective against the many mutating strains, particular to areas of the world. Is this feasible or is it worth investigating yet another mode of inhibition? Whatever the case, it's a stride all the more. I do have a technical question about VIP. With the addition of the gene to a cell's nucleus via the adeno-associated virus, does the gene randomly insert itself in the host genome, or is it only a functional gene for that particular cell? My thinking is that with cell division, that gene would be lost or could randomly insert in the genome and trigger complications. All the help and wisdom any of you could impart would be greatly appreciated. And uh, John's an undergraduate at Boston College. So the... uh... Vector that was used for this was adeno-associated virus, 
and it's being uh, delivered intramuscularly. So it's going into non-dividing cells. And under those circumstances, uh, it forms an episome, which is basically a circular, double-stranded piece of DNA that is not integrated into the chromosome. It's in the nucleus, separate from the chromosome. And it just kind of sits there indefinitely and churns out... Um, uh, is transcribed and turns out protein. There's very limited, if any, integration, so that's not really a problem. He's correct that in dividing cells, you get it's uh, lost with lost or diluted out with cell division. But that's one of the advantages of doing it intramuscularly. Is that those are non-dividing cells, and so it'll just uh, sit there and do its thing indefinitely. Right. Right, and in terms of who would be given an HIV vaccine, that's that's an area that a lot of people have been debating. Um, uh, you know, would you give it only to high risk? Would you give it to everybody? And it, I think it's ultimately going to come down to <clears throat> the specific vaccine. Right. So if it ends up being something that's uh, marginally effective, then you probably aren't going to go around giving that to everybody. If it ends up being something that's highly effective, then it might make sense to give it to everybody. Yeah, I think of our. I think our discussion of this on the show was that uh, it's probably something, at least with the current characteristics, that you'd use in a an area that had a huge problem with HIV to try and sort of uh, uh, knock it back a little bit, at least. Yeah, and in fact, I'm sure that the first, um, if this thing gets to clinical trials, they would. Uh, I would assume they would be done in places like Southeast Asia and Africa. Um, because that's where you can do those types of trials and have a, a reasonable chance people are going to be exposed to the virus. And that's where the biggest problem. And that's where the biggest problem is, and so that's where you can do the most good. All right, uh, Rich, do you want to read the next one? Sure. Mark writes, I had a few comments as I listened to this episode. Uh, he's talking about, I don't know which episode. Oh, zinc finger nucleases, yeah. Right. You discussed zinc finger nuclease technology, and I thought TWIV listeners would love this study, and he references a study. Uh, Luigi Naldini's lab used an integrase defective lentiviral vector to express a zinc finger nuclease and to provide the template <coughs> DNA used for gene correction. So they used a virus to provide both the scissors and the patch. This gives highly efficient gene transfer while the integrase deficiency allows for allows transient episomal delivery from a lentivirus, at least in pr principle. As a stem cell guy, I listened with interest to the portion of the show that discussed pluripotent stem cells. Alan rightfully pointed out that some people dispute whether pluripotent stem cells can make every cell type. For human cells, this is impossible to ethically prove since we cannot make chimeric humans. But for the mouse, it has been shown that the entire mice can be made from embryonic stem cells <laughs> or induced pluripotent stem cells using a technique called tetraploid complementation. <laughs> the way this works is that a two-celled embryo <coughs> is zapped with electricity to fuse both cells together. Mm -hmm. So your two diploid cells are now one tetraploid cell. This tetraploid cell continues to divide after the fusion and is competent to develop to the blastocyst stage, creating functional extra embryonic tissue. When combined with embryonic stem or induced pluripotent stem cells, the tetraploid cells provide the extra embryonic tissue but will rarely contribute to the embryo itself. Using this assay, it has been shown by many groups that mouse embryonic stem cells and mouse-induced pluripotent stem cells can give rise to a mouse that is composed almost entirely from these stem cells. Whoa, I'm thinking Brave New World here. Yeah. This is really amazing. <laughs> it should be noted that this is almost impossible to prove, uh, that it is almost impossible to prove that 100% of the cells are from the stem cells. And there are data to suggest that not every single cell is derived from the stem cells. But I'd say that at least where we can do the experiment, there is pretty strong evidence that embryonic stem cells and induced pluripotent stem cells are capable of making nearly every cell in the body. Mm. Our being able to recreate all of those cell types in addition <coughs> is another 
issue entirely. But this experiment, I believe, demonstrates that the potential exists. Our current challenge is to understand the developmental biology required to get each cell type. We attempt to translate how different cell pathways are activated and silenced over the course of time from model organisms to a human developmental time frame. One such success just happened next door to my lab. Lorentz Studer's group has recently demonstrated the derivation of transplantable mem uh, midbrain dopamine neurons from human pluripotent stem cells. And he gives a reference for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is Mark, who's at the, uh, he's in the S uh, SKI, that must be Sloan Kettering Sloan Institute, Kettering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, stem cell research uh, facility. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks very much. That's uh, that's good stuff. This uh, thing that he uh, talks about initially, I was not aware of, and that is, we've talked about zinc finger nucleases before, and how these are engineered enzymes that can specifically seek out a sequence that you are, have predetermined, uh, and actually clip on both sides of the sequence and <coughs> excise a chunk of uh, DNA. Right. And uh, apparently, if you supply along with that. A homologous piece of DNA with some sort of mutation or difference that you want to incorporate, mm. then the excision of the uh, uh, target sequence by the zinc finger nuclease makes that active for homologous recombination wow. with the other piece of DNA supplied in trans <laughs> so that you can actually engineer in your new sequence in a targeted fashion. I was not aware of that. Mm. And this technology that they describe here supplies both the uh, new sequence and the targeting nucleases in a lentiviral vector so that you can deliver them at the same time. Awesome. Whoa! <clears throat> Yes. My God. Any sufficiently what advanced think technology is indistinguishable from magic. My God. Good Lord. Yeah. yeah good Lord. That's right. Yeah. And yeah, I know so we probably ought to do that paper on a. Yeah, that might be that might be a good one to do. And I, I did know um, the some of the backstory at least on the um, the induced pluripotent stem cells. I just put that little asterisk there because there are there are people who still contend, hey, you haven't made them all yet. Um, but I actually I I did. Um, a meeting report for the New York New York Academy of Sciences uh, at a meeting where Lawrence Studer gave a presentation about exactly his transpl transplantable uh, dopamine neurons. So, so yeah, it's very very cool work. Great. <clears throat> All right, shall we do one more? Sure. All right. Uh, Kent writes, "Dear Jed Vry Masters." Uh, first, I wanted to thank you for the yeoman's effort all of you put into making a great podcast. I subscribe to over a dozen podcasts, and over the past year or so, TWIV has become one of my favorites. As a self-described science geek, I can say that the show you produce is truly one of the best science podcasts that can be found. I'm a computer, thank you. Uh, I'm a computer consultant by trade, but I have a decent background in biology and a soft spot in my heart for microbes and viri of all kinds, which would probably sound strange to most people, but I think you all feel the same way. Uh, I've learned quite a bit listening to you on a weekly basis for the past year, so my thanks to each of you. You're quite welcome. Mm. Yes, we, we enjoy it too. Um, uh, you may have covered this recent development in the XMRV world already. I must confess I'm a few weeks behind in my podcasts, but if not, I thought it would be good a good opportunity for you to address what seems to be the nail in the coffin for now of the XMRV to CFS link. By the uh, way, this letter's been hanging around for a while. Yes, this letter has been hanging around. We, we are a little behind on our email, so <laughs> apologies. Um, and he provides a link to the retraction uh, or a news article about the retraction from science of the Lombardi et al. paper. Um, it appears that the much disputed evidence for the link between XMRV and CFS may have all but disappeared at this point. As a somewhat educated layperson on this subject, thanks to your outstanding podcast discussions on this topic, I'm left with a few questions at this point. First, what, if anything, went wrong in the vetting process for the papers that were published in support of the XMRV CFS link? Obviously, the reviewers can't be expected to reproduce every experiment, but were there warning flags that should have, been, that should have kept these papers from being published in the first place, or is this just the sometimes messy process of scientific inquiry sorting itself out pretty much according to plan, or a bit of both? Shall we take that one? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I can't do this in detail, but uh, my understanding is that there were uh, reservations about the... It went through several reviews, review cycles, and people had reservations about it uh, initially. Uh, but I don't know 
uh, the particulars of all of that. Um, but, you know. And, uh, you know, peer review is not perfect. Peer review is not perfect. Um, That's right. In this case, I think it, this was certainly not one of the best papers that science has ever published. Um, that was obvious to me on first read. Uh, I didn't dismiss it on first read because it looked like the more or less the right experiments had been done and it was a potentially interesting finding. Um, there were there were cell biologists who were upset about some of the ways that the cell biology was described and there was a lot of uh, there there were one thing that stood out to probably everybody was the the PCR reactions were very very sensitive and therefore very susceptible to contamination. Um, but overall, you know, it was a, we talked about the, the paper on TWIV when it came out. Um, right. It was vetted pretty thoroughly. It was vetted pretty thoroughly. The, the difficulty arose after it came out and there was a lot of scientific com commentary about, well, you know, this doesn't look so good. This doesn't look so good. That's a normal part of the process. What was not so normal was that there was a lot of ad hoc rationalization and, the story seemed to shift a little bit about exactly how the experiments were done. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so that brings us to uh, the second question. Did any of the individuals involved act inappropriately during this process, either scientifically or ethically? For example, did Harvey Alter just misspeak at the Croatia conference in 2010, or should he have been much more circumspect with his declarations given the evidence he had at the time? Of course, hindsight is 2020, which is why I caveat it with at the, at the time. Actually, the link you sent us was to the retraction of the low altar paper. Oh, but, was it? Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah. But the conversation is relevant to all of these papers anyway. Right. Uh, I don't think we know uh, for sure whether anybody acted inappropriately, scientifically, or ethically. I mean, people. I mean, people behaved in a fashion that I didn't think was entirely appropriate. But in terms of real malfeasance here. Uh, like um, uh, cooking data or something like that, uh, we have no solid evidence that there was any inappropriate uh, action. But well, there are there are things that don't smell good. Yeah. <laughs> but we don't have any conclusive evidence yet. I think time will tell. And I I would say, and I did say at the time um, that certainly the folks at the WPI were not very. Um, reassuring in their behavior after this paper came out and they, for example, immediately introduced a commercial test uh, for a virus that hadn't been shown to cause any disease, even if their work was 100% correct. You didn't get to a causal link. Um, and public statements that were made, particularly by Judy Mikovits, were um, disturbing, to say the least, uh, embracing concepts that had been thoroughly discredited. And uh, I, I think that certainly didn't help in any of this discussion. Um, as for the low altar paper, um, again, you know, that was a paper, it may not have been the best thing that ever appeared in PNAS, um, but looking through it initially, it looked like the right things had been done, and to a first approximation, um, it was okay. It was the questions came up afterwards, well, you know, are these, is this the same virus, and so on. Um, and did, should he have been more circumspect speaking at the meeting that got, uh, that got ballyhooed everywhere. Um, I bet if you asked Alter that right now, he would probably tell you that he should have been. Absolutely. Right. Um, but I, I think most of the virologists who got involved in this did not know um, just how loud the discussion was going to get. Right. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so third, uh, my sense is that much of the furor over this XMRV to CFS link may have been due to scientists who were well-intentioned but over-eager to publish results that in hindsight, and perhaps even in forward sight, should not have been published, or at a minimum, they should have been much more cautious with their public declarations. Additionally, this combined with a small but understandably fervid group of CFS sufferers who latched onto what seemed like a promising explanation and pushed for a premature acceptance of the causal link in the public sphere. I can't say it much better than that. I, I think, think that's spot on. <laughs> Is that very well? Yes. Yes, I think there were a lot of people who rushed into, uh, and not even just the, the, the XMRV CFS stuff, but also the prostate cancer um, aspect of this, which, by the way, is how we first heard about XMRV. 
um, people people rushed into it. Hey, new retrovirus! This is huge news potentially, and there were a lot of a lot of papers that were probably rushed to press a little bit, and you know maybe things should have been checked a little more carefully. But in the excitement of the moment, kind of hard to get past that. And then yes, this whole this whole discussion about um, you know CFS brought in an, an entirely new angle um, that I think uh, the discussion got a lot louder than it probably should have been. Uh, and he concludes, I'd be very interested in hearing everyone's take on this subject. You just did. Um, thanks again for the great work. I know I'm not alone when I say how much I appreciate your efforts. Thank you very much. All right, so we will we'll have one more letter to leave uh, for a subsequent episode, I think. Unless, let me just look at it real quickly. Oh, yeah, we can go ahead and do this one, right? Okay. Let's go ahead and do the one from Nicholas. Nicholas writes, Dear Vince, Alan, and Rich, I absolutely love your podcast and hope you never stop producing it. I count on the three of you to keep me up to speed on some of the most interesting virus research being published and look forward to downloading a podcast every Sunday evening. I also really appreciate the fact that you continued producing TWIV through the holiday break. I wanted to bring a paper to your attention that you might consider covering on TWIB. It just came out in the journal PLOS Pathogens, and I thought it was really creative. Basically, the group engineers a dengue virus to be targeted by microRNAs that exist only in macrophages and dendritic cells. While this virus replicates normally in other cells, it is completely blocked whenever this specific microRNA is present. They then use that virus to infect mice and demonstrate that without the availability of replication in macrophages and dendritic cells, the virus cannot spread in the animal. I found this strategy a really unique way to study the function of particular cell types in response to infection. Uh, keep up the good work, Nicholas. Yeah, that's uh, that's fascinating. That's great. Yeah, I hey. haven't actually looked at the paper. That ought to go in the queue too. Yeah, definitely, uh, Nicholas. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to meet you sometime to let you know that I sometimes am also on this show. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes yeah, you had some you had some absences there, Dixon, but you've been pretty regular. I know. I know. But, Listen, uh, uh, actually, not voluntary. Uh, Dude, I always think of you as a founding part as a founding partner in this. This is important. Okay? Yes, I, I was not offended by Nicholas's letter. Trust me. <laughs> yeah, and um, I'm over here. I'm over here. <laughs> and Vincent uh, had a note underneath this letter that uh, similar strategy has been tried with poliovirus as well. Ah, uh, so we should we should probably cover uh, those in the queue. Yeah, put these in the queue. Nice. All right, so let's do a few picks. Excellent. Dixon, do you have anything? I do. I just okay. emailed it to you. Ah, I will have to check my email, which is hopefully... Check your email because you're just going to go crazy over this. It's hopefully just... working better than my Skype connection. <laughs> That's probably right. It's an amazing high-speed photography uh, take on a drop hitting a smooth uh, liquid surface. They're, they're the most amazing things I've ever seen, actually. It, they cool. look like they're made out of glass. Cool. Okay, let some me get glass blower attracted them. They're, they're, they're quite marvelous. Neat stuff. Yeah. Uh, let me see. Oh, here we go. They're just visually beautiful. That's all I can say. And, and wow. a, lot, a lot of what we pay attention to... Uh, with regards to our own love of nature, uh, revolves around the beauty yeah. aspect. You know, you're attracted to crystals of this or packages of virus. Ooh, there. some of these you would never guess. Look at this one no down kidding. here. No it's kidding. The one that looks like an umbrella. Wow. I know. Whoa. Yes. Exactly. Oh, these are great. These really are awesome. Like this is really cool. I said, I this is I, 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 that yeah. made up for four other picks that I didn't have. <laughs> Absolutely, I really like that. Those those are really nice. I hope Nicholas gets to see these. <laughs> yes, Dixon is on the show, and he can. All right, that that's, that was my pick. <laughs> Excellent. All right, Rich. Okay, so I have uh, more than a pick. I have homework. Uh -oh. <laughs> All you TWIV listeners out there, I got homework for you. So um, we have been talking about for uh, a while the, uh, shall we say, debate, the ongoing debate about um, the uh, recommendation by a group called the uh, uh, National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity 
to redact that is not published parts of the methods for some experiments that expanded the uh, well that uh, 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 passaged H5N1 influenza virus in a fashion that apparently uh, made it transmissible in mammals. And there's some concern that this could be used for nefarious purposes, and so the NSABB stepped in. In the process of talking about this <clears throat> last time, the Fink report was mentioned, and also the uh, seven areas of concern were mentioned that are supposed to be uh, considered in trying to decide whether something could be used as dual use. And I will be perfectly honest with you in saying that I did not know what the Fink report was, and I did not know what these seven areas of concern were. So I went out and educated myself, and I actually dug up the Fink report, and I read it uh, from front to back. And I would like to give a very brief synopsis of that and and uh, uh, recommend it for anybody who's interested in this uh, debate. So it's called the Fink Report because it comes, uh, it was a report of a committee chaired by Gerald Fink, who uh, was the, who uh, is at the Whitehead Institute. He's a, a yeast geneticist. Uh, and the committee met uh, during 2002, 2003, in response to both, <clears throat> obviously it was after the anthrax uh, scare and 9-11 and actually a part of the motivation too was some papers that had come up that had sort of raised some flags in terms of uh, possible dual use stuff and uh, so uh, the decision the idea was that we need some sort of a policy to deal with issues of dual use <clears throat> So this was done, the umbrella organization is the National Academy of Sciences, which is a private nonprofit uh, society of uh, scholars engaged in scientific and engineering research dedicated to the furtherance of science and technology, etc. So uh, for science in the public, the National Academy of Sciences is sort of the go-to organization. It's important right. that it's a private organization. Their sort of working arm is the National Research Council organized by the National Academy of Sciences in 1916 to associate the broad community of science and technology with the Academy's purpose of furthering knowledge and advising the federal government. So this, uh, when action is needed, the National Research Council does something. And there are a couple of other, there's the National Academy of Engineering and the Institute of Medicine sure. that do similar things in other disciplines. Mm -hmm. So the National Research Council, if you want something like this done and you don't want it done by the government specifically, you employ these guys. And they created this committee. And the committee is, was, the Committee on Research Standards and Practices to Prevent the Destructive Application of Biotechnology uh, National Research Council. And they produced this report that is called Biotechnology in the Age of Terrorism. Uh, and it is a fascinating document. And I would recommend that people at least read the preface and the executive summary, which is quite good. But I would actually, I would hope that that would engage people's attention mm -hmm. to the point of going to the introduction, which has a lot of background and the regulatory environment and et cetera. And I just want to summarize that there are uh, uh, recommendations here um, so in the executive summary, uh, they recommend that one, educating a scientific community. So they, had, they recommend that the scientific community be educated in the concept of dual use. They recommend a system for reviews of plans of the experiments, plans for experiments, and that would take, um, make use of the existing structure of biosafety committees and a recombinant DNA advisory committee. Uh, and they recommend seven areas of, they cite seven areas of concern something that would render a vaccine ineffective, something that would make, uh, render, confer resistance to uh, antibiotics or antiviral agents, something that would enhance virulence, uh, anything that would increase the transmissibility of a pathogen, anything that would alter the host range of a pathogen, anything that would enable ev evasion of diagnostic or detection modalities, anything that would enable wepo weaponization of a biological agent. So those would raise flags during um, review. Right. Uh, their other recommendation is um, review at the publication stage. 
Their other recommendation is creation, aha, creation of the National Science Advisory Board for Biodefense. So this document creates the board mm -hmm. that reviewed these papers and made this decision. Right. And it defines what that board is supposed to do uh, and additional elements against misuse, and they have a couple of other uh, recommendations. Mm -hmm. uh, a role for life sciences in the effort to prevent bioterrorism and biowarfare and harmonized international oversight. They recommend that this be taken to the international stage. Uh, I think in the context of the current debate, this is a, a key document that people need to look at, understand, formulate their own perspective on. Yeah, this is how so we got I here. Offer it. This is how we got here. Right. And this is where the NSABB came from. I find it interesting that the NSABB, they, cre they proposed creating a National Science Advisory Board for Biodefense. That's now called the National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity. So right. we've tempered hmm. the language a little bit. Right. Hmm. Anyway, rate, there you go. Cool. Excellent pick. All right. My pick uh, is a little more lighthearted. Um, <laughs> it's, <clears throat> or at least it's quicker homework. Um, this is a series of videos on YouTube. I've linked to, to one of them, and you can, in the related videos, you can find the others. They're, they're called Lab Report. And uh, these videos, uh, I'm not actually sure who produced these, but they're, they're just interviews with scientists. Um, talking about their work and explaining why they are excited about the subject that they study. And so this one, I, I linked to one, uh, Jenny Roan, who studies cell shape. Um, and uh, it's just, you know, it shows a few shots of, of her working in the lab. Um, and then just she's talking and explaining what she studies and what's cool about it and why we want to know how, sh how cells determine their shapes. Um, and it just the enthusiasm comes through so clearly and it's just it's just like you know being there um and this is uh i i thought this was really cool and a, a neat public outreach effort um to see it, it really is kind of an insight on what makes scientists tick excellent i haven't had a chance to look at this yet because it just uh came on and i don't want to the audio will the mess everything will, up, yes. but i will um i'll have a look at this it looks great all right uh then we have a listener pick of the week um this is uh from jim who we've read letters from before he's in virginia uh honored professors May I suggest a Pick of the Week podcast that captures the uh, difficult aspects of creativity and research that may help students of your craft understand the 90% perspiration part of your work. Um, and uh, then he's got a, a link to it. Um, and the description of the hour-long podcast uh, follows. William Byers of Canada's Concordia University and author of The Blind Spot talks with Econ Talk host uh, Russ, Russ Roberts about the nature of knowledge, science, and mathematics. Byers argues that there's an inher inherent uncertainty about science and our knowledge that is frequently ignored. Byers contrasts the science of wonder with the science of certainty. He suggests that our knowledge of the physical world will always be incomplete because of the imperfection of models and human modes of thought relative to the complexity of the physical world. The conversation also looks at the implications of these ideas for teaching science and social science. Ooh, which sounds pretty duty. cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So for those of you who are looking for some deep thoughts on uh, how science operates, um, this looks like a cool podcast episode. Alan, I hope you didn't take offense at his introductory clause, by the way. No, no, I am not, not at all offended. <laughs> Good. Not being a professor or honored, that's not a problem for me. <laughs> oh, dear. All right. You, could, you can find TWIV at iTunes, the Zune Marketplace, twiv.tv, and microworld.org stroke TWIV. Consider subscribing. It's free and lets you automatically receive each new episode as it's posted. If you use iTunes and haven't done so before, please leave a short comment. That helps us stay visible in the iTunes window. Also check out our Facebook page if you're on there, uh, facebook.com stroke This Week in Virology. You can also listen with the Microbe World app, which streams episodes to your iPhone or iPad if for some reason you don't feel like subscribing in iTunes. Check it out at microbeworld.org. It's now available for Android devices as well. Um, the short link for that is uh, bit.ly bit stroke 
MW Android. Um, we love to get questions and comments from listeners. It makes up a significant part of our discussion, as you've seen in this episode. Send them to twiv at twiv.tv. Dixon, thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure as usual. And you are at verticalfarm.com and also uh, medicalecology.org. Yes, and trichinella.org. And trichinella.org. You're yep. all over the place, Dixon. Yeah, hey, you listen. <laughs> Three <laughs> places at once. You can't stop a parasitologist. You can't stop. That's what, you know. <laughs> That's right. All right. Well, thank you very much. And Rich, thank you very much. You're quite welcome. It's always a good time. Having a good time. Great. And uh, Rich is at the University of Florida Gainesville, and you can see a little snippet of his work at vacciniamodel.com. It's just is, a little snippet. Yes, which is uh, the virus Rich studies modeled as a... Uh, as a as a mallow bar or a, yeah something like yeah. that uh, and I'm Alan Dove I'm at alandove.com and I'm also back on Twitter again the name is cryptically Alan Dove uh, uh-huh. you've been listening to this week in virology thanks for joining us we'll be back next week another twiv is viral <laughs>